intro. I hope I got the name halfway right. Um, for the invite, for the second time round, it hope it worked. The first time round, there was COVID, and now it's still COVID, but at least everybody's used to these online seminars. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. I think it's actually really timely because I have a little special at the end. So I will run a little bit over time, uh, but I hope you will forgive me. Uh, because I really have an exciting announcement just at the end. So thanks for inviting me today. So uh, I will be talking mostly about like REST fungi and what we do at the Australian University, uh, National University to study these. So, oh, so before I really get in, I would like to introduce my team. So this was like pre-COVID time. So, so there's no social distancing required. And it was just after some ice cream. So it was quite nice, probably just a year ago. And so we have a group of people who work on Myrtle Rust, then we work on some different aspects in beet rusts, and we do also look in pathogen detection in the microbiome. We have also students who work in odd plant genomics projects, and we have Mr. Magic, which is Ash, who does a lot of the hard work in the lab and adapting new protocols and so on. And we are also super lucky to have a bioinformatics extravaganza scientist Jana Schneider, uh, she's doing a decorator with Professor Stone and Professor Ratch, and, and we work in close co collaboration with her, and we're really thankful for that. Um, so, rust fungi. The rust fungi really have been a problem of, uh, for humankind for a really, really long time. So, if you go back in uh, Western culture, you find that the Romans, for example, had a god which was called Robigalia, which they tried to appease every April with a um, sacrifice of dogs, mostly uh, in a festival which is called Robigus. And so they tried to appease the god so the, the rust wouldn't infect the crops and they would get a good harvest. So rusts have been, have been around since human civilization, human culture has been around. And this is one example in Western culture. So rusts, they're the biggest uh, fungal order with the most plant pathogen inside, uh, uh, contained. There are roughly 8,000 uh, uh, described species. They're obligate biotrophs. They have this really tight interaction with the host and you can't culture them like without them. So they need to grow on the host and they also need to grow on living tissue. Um, then they have this really uh, peculiar stage, which are dekaryotic. So in the main stage, where the coast cause most of the damage, they have these two nuclei which are separated, and they have kept this over 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 evolutionary time scales, like some other fungi too. Uh, so there must be an evolutionary advantage, and we uh, looked at this before too. So if you had a coffee, if you had some uh, wheat, some uh, bread today, if you had like a corn syrup or maybe had a beer already, it's a little early, but I don't know where you are, so you might have gotten one already. Then you actually competed with the rest for their energy source because rusts really infect nearly everything. Um, what, what we eat and what we consume, also like pears and um, apple trees and so on. The only big crop which is not infected by rust is rice and that's a peculiarity in itself. So the rusts are not only competing for the energy sources with us, but they also uh, can be really threatening to whole ecosystems. For example, myrtle rust is one of these invasive uh, disease in New Zealand and Australia, which really threatens the ecosystem. So rust can be also pretty pretty though. So here that the infections, they have this really bright color. That's like wheat leaf rust or, um, on, the, on the wheat. And you see these postules, which are like uh, light brown. Whereas like the myrtle rust uh, here uh, from an article in New Zealand has this really golden color. And if you collect these spores, it really looks like gold, even so it's actually not um, that good for the ecosystem. So let's talk a little bit about myrtle rust to introduce the topic a bit. So myrtle rust is caused, it's, it's a disease and it's caused by Australopoxidina CDI. Um, it has been in incursion in New Zealand uh, 2017 and it came to Australia in 2010. So, and this was really work done by Jeff Peck and Angus Carnegie who discovered this and described this really early on. So a couple of species you might actually know, it's maybe for example, the, the native guava or the brush turpentine. These are two species which are really threatened by this and might actually go extinct because of myrtle rust. And paper park 
uh, up in Queensland is also like a species you might know and is threatened by this pathogen. So because it infects so many species, it can be uh, threatening for our ecosystem. So myrtle rust really comes from South um, America, from Brazil. That's where, where it was first described and it infects over 500 host species. So it has, has a broad host range, which is a little unusual for the rest, at least as we uh, know and describe them, uh, which are normally like more focused on one or two species. Um, and it's an invasive pathogen in many ecosystems, as you can see here. So it's the different colors and forms of the dots, uh, the different biotypes, which are, you can think about lineages. And you can see is that you have the pandemic lineage which really spread in the Pacific region and also to South uh, Pacific region, New Zealand, Australia, the most recent time. So Australia is 2010 and New Zealand, I think, was 2017. And because it infects also Merdisea, like vapor pork and uh, native guava and such, it really uh, threatens the ecosystem. And we have some species which might actually go extinct because of this. Um, and this is all really nicely summarized by this uh, review of volcanic impact. So it's a major threat to Medusae, and it's really distributed all over the East Coast, as you can see here, either in natural environments or in, in uh, human managed environments. Um, and what's also peculiar about it is that it can affect regrowth. So especially after fire, it actually has a risk that some of this regrowth of the pathogen is around there can affect especially regrowing, rejuvenating a material. So a slight switch, I introduce the, the wheat rusts. The so wheat rusts, uh, of course, infect wheat and wheat is uh, an agricultural ecosystem, so it's slightly different. So what you have here is often that resistance towards these pathogens is controlled by genetics. So for example, here you have a resistant variety which does not infect it, it's just next to it, it's planted uh, susceptible variety, sorry, sorry, it's a little cut off. And so you see that it gets this yellow color, so this is called also yellow and striped rust, so this disease. And if you really have a heavily infected field, you have like, <clears throat> millions and billions of spores so they stick to your shoes or if you harvest it uh, with a thresher then you see like this huge huge cloud and you can imagine so there's billions and billions of spores uh, um, in this dikaryotic stage. So the wheat rusts are also if you combine them there's three major wheat rusts the sleep rust, stripe rust and stem rust. Combined they're probably the major threat of wheat production globally with the biggest impact. So here um, red is more impact and blue is low, uh, less impact. So you can see that leaf rust is kind of everywhere all the time a little bit, where stripe rust is also everywhere, but has some regions, especially in, uh, in Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa, where it has more impact. And stem rust, thanks to normal ball work and also cloning and, and lots of resistance gene breeding into wheat, it's not that much of a problem, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, because of new strains which are coming about, it has a huge impact on Sub-Saharan Africa. So also what happens often, so these rusts come in a certain region and overcome these uh, resistance genes, which I will introduce in a minute, like one at a time. And like also like myrtle rust, we as humans to the trade or traffic or simply tourists, we actually like uh, carry around these disease like with us and this is why it's so important to have good biosecurity measures in countries like Australia and New Zealand so we don't get more of these pathogens into these countries. All right, so a brief introduction to the plant immune system um, for people who are not that much uh, familiar. It's uh, adapted from John Ratchin here at ANU and Peter Dots at um, CSIO. So really plants don't have an adaptive immune system. So everything in plants is innate. So it means everything is encoded within with the genome. Uh, conceptually, they have, they have two layers of the immune system. So one is the recognition of molecules extracellularly. So this is a plant cell, the green one. And here you have this immune receptor receptor like kinases and co-receptor which recognizes molecule at the outside and most of the time they are conserved molecules. <clears throat> so plants get by infected by <clears throat> fungi or mycetes and also bacteria. So the second layer in viruses and all other stuff and these have these have these called effectors. So they secrete these effectors 
in certain ways into the cytosol and inside the cytosol these effectors try to manipulate the host to for the advantage either by suppressing the immune system or um, for neutron acquisition and such. The, these effectors also can be recognized, some of them by specific resistance proteins. So this is a second class of uh, proteins, which are mostly local or exclusively localized actually in the cytoplasm or in, inside the cell. And the recognition of these effectors also leads to uh, immune response. The strength of the immune response really varies uh, on the specific interaction. And then on top of this, there's a little bit of physiologically genetic encoded um, resistance types as well, but I'm not gonna mention this also. So historically in agriculture, um, these intracellular immune receptors, especially for the rest, have been the major like resistance gene. So if you have a resistance gene, here's a protein, which recognizes a specific effector, then you are resistant. So this was uh, also coined the gene for gene hypothesis. How we can also think about this is the key lock principle. So if the pathogen has the right key, it fits into the R gene um, lock and it unlocks the plant immune system. And the plant immune system kind of uh, defends against the pathogen. So if you don't have the right key, if you don't have the right lock, then the pathogen is lucky in the sense that it has effectors, but they don't fit with the arsenal of the plant, it has a resistance gene, and then you get disease. So why is this important? So if we think now about biosecurity, we have touched on just a little bit, um, what kind of questions do we have? If we have new pathogen coming in, so the first question that you have is probably, is the pathogen present? So if you confirm this, then you want to know what lineage and what genotype of the pathogen is present. And then if you interbreeding and agriculture, then it's really also important what is effector arsenal, so what complement of effectors does the pathogen have? So I would argue that genomics is a really, really good tool for most of those and are actually like a prerequisite. They're actually probably the only tool for some addressing some of these questions. So for the pathogen present absent analysis, you can have other tools. Um, they will tell you, oh yeah, it's a present absent present, but genomics and PCRs and molecular biology is a really good tool. For these other two, I think genomics is probably one of the best tools to do this. So if you're interested what kind of lineage and genotypes a pathogen has, you kind of look for neutral loci, so for randomly distributed loci, so you could do uh, low coverage shotgun sequencing, or you could do DART sequencing. Really what you want, you want to call a couple of SNPs and variants, like polymorphisms, and then do phylogenetic inferences, how different your current isolate is from what just came in. And then there's another layer to this, in case of the effectors, you will really want to know these lower cell which are recognized by the plant immune system and they are of course selected for so they are specific loci so what you would like to do here is a phylogenetic inference and i would argue it's pretty simple as soon as you have a genome sometimes you don't need a genome you can make these phylogenetic inferences and can tell us something is new or has been always been around and how different it is in general really what's more complicated and also requires more work is to identify these loci which are selected for, like these effectors. And then you don't necessarily want to know if there's a SNP or no SNP, but you want, or like a variant, but you, what you really would like to know what's the functional impact of this. So will this be effectors still recognized by the plant immune system or not? Or will this be functional in other terms or not? So this is a slight more complicated um, um, measure. So, of course, if you're a government or in a big institution or so, what you would like to have on top of this is, of course, a data management and, and, and an analysis hub. Because it's good if you have one researcher does something over here, another researcher does something over here, but over time you wanna like uh, accumulate the data and be able to continuously analyze this so that you can really say if something comes new into the country or how does it compare to stuff like 10 years ago idly or how does it compare to other like public stuff and you would probably like to have everything integrated so and probably manage and also securely manage if you have um, privacy rights and other uh, questions. 
So today I will talk to you how we address this with some of those pathogens, how far we are, and I will give you a little bit of an overview of what we do with kind of a couple of excerpts uh, of genome biology mostly because we at a th uh, really at the genomic stage for the first two topics and the third topic is how we apply some novel technologies to detect pathogens and where we would like to go and then at the end I have a little bonus. All right let's talk about the redress again. So the redress, uh, this in case, in case of stripe rust, a really important disease. Globally, they have an impact of $1 billion just in, in loss. Um, on top of it comes all the fungicide application and so on. So the, it, it's quite a bit big of uh, impact uh, and investment to pharma has to do to keep it down. So, uh, so wheat stripe rust is called, caused by Voxinia striformis formosophistialis triticide. So that's a pathogen. Uh, during the infection stage uh, of wheat, it has these two nuclei. Which, uh, however, if you, which is mostly what most people study, so this is asexual infection cycle. However, really, it has this more uh, complex life cycle, uh, which has many more different spore stages and also an infection of a different host, which is phylogenetically uh, quite distinct which is actually a dicot and a monocot, and they're, I think, a couple hundred million years phylogenetically um, separated. Uh, the main take home message here is that you really, if you want to understand the pathogen, you cannot only study the uh, sexual, asexual stage in wheat, but really you have to study the whole cycle um, because this whole cycle also generates genetic diversity and might also lead to new variants which could invade, for example, Australia again. All right, so what have we done in the last year? So since I arrived in 2015, I think we made some really good progress. Initially, uh, still, in, in, still in collaboration with uh, a great mentor, John Ragin, who is a professor here at ANU. And so what, what we've done over the years is that we started, when I started, uh, was we had like these cut up spaghetti, as I call them. So we, both of these nuclei, the genomes, they were kind of cut up and jumble mumble. So you couldn't really tell much what belongs together. And your context was the strings of piece, uh, DNA, which should represent your genome, was really cut up in 30,000 pieces. So over the years, we adapted the latest and greatest uh, genomic te technologies. And I will talk about a little bit of the publication, which has these partially phased genomes. So we can say where these two nuclei are different from each other, but we can't say which piece of DNA become, be, uh, belongs to which nucleus. But we get the numbers quite nicely down instead of like uh, 30,000 like into low hundreds. And so we have some two recent publications on this and where we really are now, but we haven't really published uh, our full complement, but we're working on especially with uh, Jana Schwerschneider, is these fully resolved chromosomes where we can assign each chromosome to each nucleus. And we contributed our technologies and know-how to a recent publication, Nature, Genome, uh, Nature Communication, which was uh, published by people at Cyro across the road. So a little bit of a genomic study here, uh, uh, mm, story here. So what we did, we did compare some isolates on wheat, which are long-term asexual, which are globally distributed, but have low genetic diversity to an isolate from the Himalayan, re recently from the Himalayan region, um, which has at a population level higher genetic diversity. And so by comparing these two genomes to each other, we asked the question, what is the effect of long-term asexual uh, reproduction versus sexual reproduction on the genome? So it's the next three or four slides. Uh, all this the recently sexual isolate um, is in brown and the more recent long-term uh, sexual, asexual lineage, uh, which we can trace back to the 50s in Europe is uh, blue. So what's, like, what do you find if you look at uh, these genomes and compare them? So the first thing we found is that the genome of the long-term asexual isolate seems to be quite extended uh, expanded. Then this expansion is partially uh, caused by transposal elements. So we have a correlative uh, content of transposal elements. We also could measure different uh, in different ways heterozygosity. So we could 
called SNPs, which is like single point mutations. And because we had these long fragments of DNA, we can also compare like bigger structural variants between the two subgenomes and these two like nuclei. And also here the value is higher. And another measure of long-term asexual evolution, at least in um, mammals and such, is that you get a telomere shortening over time and we see something similar uh, in these isolates too. So I'll show you like a little bit of real data too. So here, this is TH. So this is like a, a proxy for it. So this is a young T's. And what you can see, transposable elements, like when they accumulate, it is fairly similar in both of those isolates. So there's nothing, nothing different. However, when the difference in TE content happened, most of it is really related to this uh, more, more recent burst and um, TE expansion. Um, and if you look at the certain fam super families, which causes like classic candidate is uh, LTR gypsies. So these are really uh, quite enlarged in this long-term asexual isolate. So we don't know if this most recent sexual isolate lost some of those or if they actually expanded after, after in the asexual isolate, but we think that's actually more that the sexual isolate lost some. Um, so, the, oh, sorry. The other is the heterozygosity, and I'll show you this very briefly. So, the blue one bar is higher in all of these plots than uh, the brown one. That's kind of the message here. And what I would point out here is that because we have these partially phased genomes and we have like long chunks of DNA, what we can look at is uh, the difference between those haplotypes in bigger chunks. And this is important because if you look at how, like where your different polymorphism size is um, between the haplotypes, you see that most of your difference is actually in big variations, so between 500 and 10 KB. And your SNPs is actually really a very minor point um, in terms of uh, haplotype variation. So these phase genomes are really important to actually be able really to capture diversity between those two uh, uh, nuclei and the heterozygosity is increased in the long-term asexual isolate. All right, so that was kind of like a quick snapshot where maybe at the genomic state of our, our uh, bigger re research goals, which uh, will accumulate in increasing biosecurity. And we have a couple of other questions which we'll address, which is different uh, host infections. We try to compare these in different whole, hopefully in the future, and also on weed, if you have different beat lines, which are these effectors which are recognized by different beat lines, that's also what you like, would like to find out. All right, switching gear a little bit. So now we talk on modulus. So if you uh, paid close attention, you might not. Uh, the, the genome of the wheat rust is roughly like 80 megabases. In comparison, Myrtle rust has a really huge genome. So like haploid genome size is one gigabase, which is the biggest fungal genome sequence and analyzed to date. Uh, it's also bigger than its host. So Myrtle say roughly have a haploid genome size of 700 megabases. So it was quite an exciting project, which was really a nice collaboration with people at University of Sydney, uh, Planted Foods, and also others like um, in Australia. So why is it so big? So as the genome is so big uh, because it has lots of transposal elements, so it has this huge burst. Uh, the burst profile here, like when this burst happen, is slightly different, or it's actually quite different to the um, stripe burst I showed you before. And also most of the burst, it's like, like this major burst here is actually driven by a single superfamily. So when we meant about the dates, this burst happens roughly one to five million years ago. And this is after the diversification of the Merdisei. So Merdisei radiated around the globe roughly 40 million years ago. And so this expansion of the genus happened after, um, afterwards. And it's kind of tempting that it is to speculate that it's related to the host expansion of this fungus. But we have no data on this. Um, OK, so what are the interesting feature of this genome? So a little small other nugget of genome biology. So this CDI really has a big shift uh, to a lower GC content 
which is quite uncharacteristic for other rust fungi. And here, one comparison, which is this striped rust fungus, which has a discrete genome uh, GC peak around 45. So um, we wanted to know why, what have caused, potentially caused this shift of uh, a GC content. And of course, uh, transposable elements and the expansion of the genome might be related to this. So what we looked at is if younger TEs have still a high uh, GC content similar to uh, Fibrest, and if older ones have maybe less, uh, a lower GC content. And this is what, like, like what we've seen. So the T, T family, uh, which are younger, um, have like a relatively high GC content. And the older you, you kind of get, you, the less, uh, the lower your GC content is. And so then we ask the next question, is this related with CPG sites? And so CPG sites uh, are the major methylation sites in rust fungi, which we uh, just showed in another preprint led by Jana Sperschneider. And what you can see here, again, if you're young, you actually have a good amount of CPG sites, which could be methylated. But if you get older, you actually lose um, a lot of these CPG uh, sites like over time. And so what probably happened here is that this, this is, that the, there was a T burst and since the genome tried to methylate it and since the methylation leads actually to the, from the 5MC to a T to a thiamine transversion because it's well known that 5MCs are hyper mutatable, they're less stable than regular cytosines. And so this is probably a mechanism how to silence these TEs at a given point in time. And then first by methylation and then actually by mutation. And because we have so many TEs, you see this enrichment and, or depletion of GC content. Okay, so just a, was a small nugget. If you wanna read more, we have some bio archive. Um, and what would you like to do next is really now we have a genome, so we have a good blueprint to actually develop the markers for being able to survey if you get new incursions in Australia or not. Then we also work in cloning a couple of these resistance genes. I decided because we only worked on the one data set. Cool. Uh, we worked on multiple data sets. Uh, can you maybe switch off your mic, please? Yeah, I decided I'll, I'll go through the motions of them all again. All right. And I got to the end, I was like, what the fuck is my standard error not looking the same as this? <laughs> and I was like, why the fuck did you multiply by two? That makes no sense. But then it wasn't the standard error anymore, was it? it was Sorry, Ben, uh, just, like just give me a second. There is a difference, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I'm just going to mute everyone. I think they all put you back control, OK? Um, yeah. So the standard error is just. Sorry, right. thank, uh, thank just you. go ahead, thank no, you. Yeah, no worries. Um, so let me, all right. So we also trying to clone a couple of these resistance genes based on germplasm, which is kindly provided by other people like Jules Friedman and such. Um, and then we tried to develop some markers to maybe like score if these resistance genes are present in natural populations. So, Really, what I told you is kind of like stories from these partially phased genomes where we have still these phase swaps and we can't assign stuff to nuclei. So what we have been adapting is novel technologies and we have these phase swaps and we are not at the chromosome level and we can't assign these um, to nuclei. So really by project which is led by Ashley Jones and Janus Bersneider, we, we adapted novel technologies while working with phase genomics, which uh, uses these, which is called HiC. I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but the outcome of this is really that we now have fully uh, phase chromosomes where we know which chromosome goes to which nuclear. So why is this important? So if you have these phased chromosomes uh, in, a, in a sign, them, then you can look for structural, structural variation between those, um, a leader variation, and also look for genes which are only present once. And these might be effectors which are easily lost. We can do like some nice genome biology with this and compare this to lifestyle, life stage, and host adaptation. We can compare, again, this long-term asexual versus sexual reproduction. 
And then it's a really good blueprint to clone these effectors, which you're interested in, in terms of which effectors are recognized by which read variety, for example, uh, because this will allow us then to, uh, to breed better read resistance, maybe more durable read resistances, and also we can monitor these pathogen population, which in circulation, not only of the new incursions, but also which kind of effectors they have, and are these effectors actually recognized by the plant immune system or not? So which is the best read line to grow, for example, we could tell farmers. All right, so this is why this is really important to, to get to this haplotype phase. So the last bits of real information, uh, I will talk how we actually go towards pathogen detection. And so it's another piece in this biosecurity puzzle. So as you know, pandemics have been a thing uh, recently with COVID for us humans, but for plants in agriculture, this is like a very regular all the time thing. So for example, see a picture of stem rest, which is uh, back in, in Europe a couple of years ago. Then a uh, big Australian story, of course, is um, Panama disease, which had a big impact on freshly grower up in Queensland with the T4, TO4 introduction. And then also, if you may be from Europe or you know like olives, then you might also be aware that uh, like olive trees have been uh, quite a big um, hit by Xylella, which is like a bacterial pathogen which goes into Asylum. All right, so what we're trying to do is kind of to develop technologies which uh, are portable and easy applicable in different settings. And so to detect these uh, pathogens and also the microbiome as well at the same time. So that's why we choose the Minine because it's like it's cheap to buy, so it's like a thousand bucks. So people from the Department of Primary Industry, for example, can buy this. And you can also like portable, so you can set it up in different settings. So that's why we went to this technology for now. Um, so I show you a very brief um, um, proof of concept study. So we had, we worked with people at the Department of Primary Industry in New South Wales. Uh, with um, Andrew Milgate, which sent us a couple of samples which were infected on wheat. We didn't know um, which line was infected with what, but we extracted the DNA and did the data analysis. So this was kind of like the big field. Some of them were infected, some of them were not. We got the samples and then we extracted the DNA and then we sequenced everything in this case. And so the disease we looked at is striped breast again, then we have some cymosoptoria, then we have some yellow spot, and then we have also mixed infection and we also did a negative control course. And then we simply, in this case, we simply counted uh, how many of these reads mapped to a certain genome, to a certain pathogen genome. And what you can see here, in most cases, it's actually really obvious um, which pathogen was present. So uh, P. tritiacea repentantis is the yellow spot, was clearly in this sample, not as much in other samples. And our non-infected control, we didn't see anything. What was also interesting, we found actually a pathogen which doesn't, which people don't actually thought wouldn't be present in New South Wales much uh, because it doesn't cause disease, but it, disease, but it's actually present, but it seems not to be causing disease, which is pinodorum in our case, and we confirmed this with specific PCR primers too. So yeah, so this is a very brief introduction. So that we also use as like a mobile sequencing and technologies to really go down the road, the applicable road, and how we can detect pathogens in certain settings. Um, yeah. So what we do currently uh, with Andrew Mulligate is to go out and we have this field trial every year where we do infections and also to kind of try to test the limit of detection. So can we detect this pathogen early on in, um, in the growing cycle before we see any disease? And also if you have different disease, how does the microbiome change with these different diseases? And does, it, does this have an impact on the disease outcome? All right, so now that's a bonus. Um, so I'm really excited because it fits really well that I got invited by UC to give a talk today. And I think it was also a little serendipitous because today we're gonna sign a contract with the ACT government, which involves uh, University of Canberra, Univers uh, Australian National University, and a company which is called Diversity Area, which is, uh, some of you might know, which is located at the University of Canberra. And we signed a 
contract with the government for some funding around a new platform, which hopefully led us to future-proof biodiversity and biosecurity analysis to kind of build this data analysis hub and data management hub different people can uh, go into. So it's really exciting, really grateful for the government to actually put money in it. And also brings these two institutions together with uh, a very exciting um, commercial partner. So what is this uh, transformation, uh, transformation analyst that's supposed to do? So it's really said we generate, will generate a core data repository, which uh, intersects with different computing infrastructures. And the idea is that like large companies like Chevron, for example, or GADC or other industry clients could interact with this uh, platform. And then we can do monitoring with certain technologies, either DartSeq or with the technologies I just introduced. And then over time, there will be a repository and you can analyze the data on it and such. Similar, all kinds of researchers in population ecology or spatial ecology, uh, and other points we already used that will be also have access to this hub. And so it will enable Australia and other, and other countries too, to really have long-term genetic studies, which brings together all these individual studies into one hub and let uh, ensures continuity. So really um, what we have is this uh, tiny starting block. What we hope is to grow this out really as a community. So first of course, the use cases, of course, biosecurity at, diff at the border or after the border is a very uh, obvious one with the passenger detection or also population moni monitoring after fire, it, like it's another one. So how genetic diverse are the remaining populations of a plant or uh, other animal species and to kind of guide conservation then who could who do we hope to collaborate with it's of course like big uh, companies also like in universities and the re other researchers also international universities of course governments and uh, hd parks for example will already work with, with, with dart for example and really what our end goal is is a positive societal impact so we hope that such, such a platform which we hope to grow this next couple of years um, really has input in impact in terms of improved biosecurity, better species conservation. If you have mining companies come in that they have to more strictly monitor the impact on the biodiversity. And of course, grow the ACT like, like knowledge economy. And I think it's pretty exciting because this will be signed today. Okay, so this is uh, the data management part of our security pipeline which we hope to build. So just coming back to the biosecurity now, the really what I told you today about is like we are kind of at the genomic like step. For the, we definitely at the step uh, stage also where we can uh, have neutral loci and monitor new incursions. I think that's really exciting, and we hope to develop something uh, on myrtle rust and also like on the stripers soon. And we are working towards getting these functional influences with the pathogens and factors as well. And we have this integrative hub, which just got funded by the ACD government, which hope in part enables a long-term study and uh, bring people together and also leads to data con uh, conservation over time. So really, our study system for this is Myrtle Rust and Stripe Rust. And I hope I had enjoyed the talk and I hope you learned a little bit like what, like what we do and how we try to do basic science integrate novel technologies to really advance our basic understanding but also with an applied outcome to increase biosecurity in Australia and around the world. So I leave it at that. There are really lots and lots of collaborators. Like I'm really grateful with all everybody at ANU, like John Ratchin and uh, Janos Berschneider for example. Uh, it's great to have them around and many many other people like on the floor and so on. But I'm not going to read them all out uh, uh, but everybody I'm working with I'm really grateful to work with because we have, that's a great team. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Um, does anyone have any questions for Ben? You can share it in the chat or you can just uh, raise your hand or uh, unmute yourselves and ask any questions that you may have at the moment. I'll start it off. Uh, I had a one quick question for you, Ben. Um, with your new project that you're signing, the Integrated Hub 
for big data. You know how one of our projects is aiming to provide this kind of technology for government, for them to use it in portable applications and so on. Do you foresee that this uh, data hub could be used as, um, I guess, a comparison framework for most of the detections that they would have with the mean ion, for instance? Uh, could it be a, sp a space where government could, for example, um, upload the reference databases and use that as a basis for all of their analysis? Yes, so that's it, like, so it's that this, yes. Short answer, yes. <laughs> this is exactly what it's supposed to do. I mean, it should, uh, like, they have this integrative system where also people then kind of have, like, really granular access. So the idea is that, of course, at the end, that everybody shares the data, but in, initially you have kind of, like, a very controlled granular access to what you share out or not. But you also have the analysis attached, and in the project there's actually a small chunk of money in there where we try to integrate the MINI and other kind of data types into this platform and also link it then back to the metadata, of course. So there's also an idea to get like an app, for example, where people can, or on the like screen uh, uh, also as well, to uh, input the data, like how it was sampled, when it was sampled and stuff, so that everything is linked together and then you enable like all these long-term an analyses. But yes, that's exactly the idea to kind of provide an overarching framework where people can like buy, like or sign up to and get into. So it's not this piecemeal data sets hanging around. I think that's, that's really the idea, yeah. Excellent, thank you so much. Well, we have a few questions in the chat. So first from Kyle Hemming. Um, he's asking, why is there lower heterozygosity in the sexual strain versus the asexual one? Yeah, yeah so that's a ID. That's a good question. So our hypothesis around this, you know, if you have sexual recombination, then you have like, yeah, no. Then you also like have recombination between your chromosomes and then you have like gene conversion, for example, or you have this crossover um, with between t transposable elements and then you, you, you lose some of them again. So we are really that these meiotic crossover, mitotic crossovers, these will lead to gene conversion and this will, the collect, so selection can act up on and so you will have some increased homozygous like reduced heterozygosity on the other side which is for the reducing uh, heterozygosity on the other side is because you have these two nuclei in your asexual lineages so you kind of kind of accumulate mutation independently and so they kind of never see each other at least simplified so these two chromosomes don't see each other. So this chromosome on this side will accumulate mutation. This will increase on the other chromosome will uh, accumulate other mutations. And you can't cross them over. You can't purge them. So they're just accumulating over time and they just get more and more heterocycles. That's kind of the idea here. Thank you. Anthony has a question. Anthony, do you want to uh, say it out loud or do you want to write it in the chat? Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh, great. Hey, Ben, thank you very much for that. It's all very exciting. Um, I was just curious about what sort of um, uh, pipeline or package of pipeline of packages you're using to capture that workflow you're describing. Uh, which workflow? For the, so the, that, the, the pipeline from the data repository through to the analysis and the different groups and the cycles. Uh, so yeah, so of course, this is just, this funding just started. <laughs> so. In, initially, it will build on data pipelines which were built for KD Dart, in my understanding, which is built by Dart and I think it's op also open source, which is kind of like analysis pipeline which comes from from agricultural fields. So this will be then adapted to the ecology and also uh, Dart R, which is developed at UC, will be integrated into this pipeline initially. So. It will be initially probably focused more on the Dart R data, a Dart data sets, but part of the project will be to adapt it to new data sets. So they have like, for example, Milan data, whole genome data, also integrated into the platform. And this is what the funding is for actually to generate these uh, platform, what people want to use. And so we will have like workshops, for example, as well, where we kind of gauge what the community actually wants. So this really, um, a lot like kind of a co-design principle where we will survey the community uh, what kind of pipelines would you would like and such 
uh, to use or would be best for your use case, another use case. And so we will uh, have this co-design principle to build something which is, of course, used and useful for the community. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. That's very, very exciting. Does anyone else have any more questions for Ben? Hello. Um, I was just going to ask a, a quick question um, about the um, the two nuclei, and and if I understand you correctly, the the genome in the two nuclei differs. Um, and is this very unusual? Do any other group of organisms have something similar? And what might be the evolutionary advantage of of having such a system? Thank you. You asked my favorite question. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Ben. Yeah. So. No, only only fungi. So only fungi. So also ascomycetes, which is a big uh, group of fungi, and basidomycetes, which the rest belong to. Only these the D carrier have two nuclei, and often some of these have actually multiple. Like for example, some of the other fungi have like hundreds of nuclei um, in the spore. But really, this T this T carrion is the extended life stage of a D carrion. I think it's fairly specific to the rusts. Um, and yes, so the DNA is different in these two nuclei for, like, from each other. So one, and it's a very good question, what is actually the real evolutionary advantage? So while we know that being diploid has an advantage over haploid in fungi and there's really good studies, there's not really a conclusive study which compares haploid, diploid, and uh, decaryotic. However, what we know about being dekaryotic is that you can swap complete nuclei. So one of these big major stem rust isolates, which is in the sub-Saharan Africa, actually arose by swapping nuclei between two isolates. So one nucleus come from one isolate, one from another one, and they came combined. And because they kind of work like one linkage group each, and so they come together and similar to heterosis, they generate phenotypes which are unique to this new pair. So there is probably like an evolutionary advantage to be able to swap these nuclei together and generate really rapidly novel allele pair combination, which gives you advantage over your parent, like so to speak. And this has been the case with one of those really important stem rust isolates, which is called UG99, which we published last year with people at CSIRO. Yeah, really interesting and sounds really unusual. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, with that, we'll just finish off the, the seminar. Thank you so much, Ben. It was very insightful and uh, quite a lot of information to digest and a lot of future opportunities coming your way. Congratulations and thank you for being here, yeah? Yeah, thank you very much, Alejandro, for the invite. Great to talk. Okay. Bye. Uh, thank you all for joining. We'll see you next Friday for the next seminar. Um, and if you're keen to see this presentation again, Libby uh, Roberts will be uploading this to YouTube as soon as we have um, the information on the, um, on the link for the video, we'll make it public, okay? Thank Excellent. you. Thank you all. Bye, Ben. See you later. Bye.